thank you for uh, you know being at backstage. I think you see that the audience is full, and this is a great session. I think you know if you look at most of the backstage uh, con attendees, you know you're either you're adopting it, you're thinking about adopting it. I think hearing stories, success stories, failure stories from uh, various companies trying out IDP rollouts is going to be a great uh, great learning experience. So I hope that you get a lot out of this session. Um, my name is Balaji Siva Subramanian. I lead the developer tools at Red Hat, and I'm going to be the moderator for the panel. And we have great four uh, panelists here. Um, let's just start with the, from, from the left here, Lilith. Hi, everyone. My name is Lilith Yanokian. I'm excited to be here. Um, I have a decade plus in developer experience including at companies including Netflix and Meta. Currently, I am at Roku as a director of developer experience. Srini. Hello, everyone. Very excited to be here. Uh, I'm Srinivas Perry. I'm Ado from Adobe. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the entire cloud native and the Kubernetes and the community because Adobe relies quite a bit on CNCF technologies. And we are here because of uh, CNCF. Thank you so much for that part of it. And uh, um, I lead the developer experience part at Adobe. And we use quite a bit of uh, Argo backstage and all that. And looking forward to share some of the stories with you and learn from you all. Jay. Howdy, y'all. Uh, so my name's Jay. I'm with American Airlines as a uh, principal engineer and technical lead on our shared Kubernetes clusters that we front with backstage. So looking forward to having a discussion and sharing some of our very long journey with backstage. Serena. Hi, everybody. My name is Serena Cakley. I work for JP Morgan, and I'm the head of UX for our uh, engineer platform um, and integrated experience uh, group. And I've previously worked at Red Hat, so I've been in developer experience for, I don't know, a good 15 years or so. So looking forward to the panel. Uh, all right, great. Before we get started, maybe can you get a, a show of hands? How many people are already backstage in production? All right, that's a, that's a quite a lot of the folks. That's great. And how many are looking into it or planning to roll out? All right, cool. So hopefully, hopefully both of the audience uh, would, would benefit, you know, from from this uh, from this talk. You know, I'm always curious about everybody's journey to IDP or why even internal portal it takes their own little reasons for it. And uh, some some folks are have a specific pain they want to solve, and some have a very generic approach of how do I improve developer productivity or developer, uh, you know, uh, enhance experience, et cetera, at a larger level. So I want to maybe go through each of you, talk about why um, you pursue the path of IDP portals. I know portals is not something, um, what do you call, uh, unique. You know, it's been there like since long days, but why sort of a centralized portal, if you may, right? That's what I'm thinking about, like backstage is a centralized portal or any other IDP centralized portal. Um, what drove you to that journey? It would be good to understand the pain points that you guys face, and what would you say? Maybe go out a bit. All right. So, um, depending on the size and the maturity of the company, um, they are in different parts of the journey. I'll t t talk about my most recent experience at Roku. So we were thinking about how much of the developer experience should be centralized and tooling and owned by one team versus distributed and community-owned, community-driven. And we were gravitating towards the second category more, that anybody should be empowered to make the tools, right, and publish those tools and enable the, everyone in the company um, to develop tools, plugins, whatever they need to do their work the best. Um, one thing that really, really motivated and drove to um, using a uh, uh, IDP was uh, my group hosted a uh, developer tooling conference where we asked everybody across engineering to come and present or nominate the tools that they have developed that they thought somebody else could use. Um, and what was really fascinating, like we got a lot of entries. And what was fascinating were that there were multiple teams that have built the same tools. We got multiple log viewers. We got multiple of the same sorts of tools. And you know why? Why is this happening? Why did, did this all keep keep happening? Because um, people didn't know these tools existed. Uh, we had flat lists of tools published somewhere on the wiki or Confluence, but having a centralized place that everybody can go and 
build on top of the templates or build on top of the tools that are already there, right, and discover the tools that are already there was not in place. So that was the key motivation for us. Yeah. So I would like to kind of ask how, kind of some kind of a persona, right? How many of you are actually an application developers? How many are application developers? Okay. And how many of you are SRE, uh, ops? Yeah. And how many of you are actually an engineering leaders or in the leadership uh, trying to bring this change in your company? That's great. I see a few of them. Yeah, I think uh, the way I would like to kind of answer is if you are a developer and if you are on on-call any of these days or you are in on any of the on-call escalation path, right? So as you speak, as you are having your uh, issue, you probably have a browser with a lots and lots and lots of tabs open, right? You probably, and you don't, you probably don't have half of them. You don't know how they uh, navigate this. So the cognitive load of how much you need to navigate to get to the information that you need to get at any point of time is enormous. And that is only getting more and more and more difficult, right? So the way I kind of look at IDP is the P part of IDP is, is a portal and which is backed by the platform behind the scenes, right? So it's not, if you have not started your journey of a portal, which probably makes sense if you are just getting started with a, um, uh, just a Kubernetes part of it, which we did as well. It's not the question of if, but the question of when, right? I think we definitely need uh, a centralized way to be able to do it. It's a quite a bit of journey. Um, you have to start somewhere, I know, to keep it going. I, I was one of the initial uh, persons who was not convinced on portal is needed because there's a lot of other priorities that we need to work on, right? But I am more than convinced right now that IDP is a very important part of uh, everything that we have to do. Yeah, so I think for, for motivations for American, I think you really need to go and kind of look at the organization itself. So we are an airline, so some of you may know, some of you may not. We have a lot of legacy tech. Um, our legacy was legacy 25 years ago. When you combine that truly astounding level of, of legacy going from mainframe all the way to who knows, but when you combine that with the mergers that the airline industry has gone through, it's uh, not one company, it's a combination of 20 or 30. When you have those two things combined, you end up with a very natural balkanization of your IT infrastructure. Um, you have people that have been there for 40 years, 30 years, and you know, you have people from other companies that were that were new. When you have that level of balkanization, every project is new project is difficult, and everything turns into a who you know game, right? It's like, well, Gary over on network team 70 does DNS stuff. Someone else does this VMware acquisition, right? Like it's you 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 months and months, and you got to know certain people. It's just not feasible. I think that the primary motivation with backstage for us was to lessen that discovery need, lessen the need for a PhD in American Airlines politics and make things, get the lead times quicker, right? Kind of remove some of those those silos that just naturally happen to an organization that, uh, as old as us. And it's been phenomenally effective at that. Great. Yeah, and with JP Morgan, I think it's very similar to everything that you guys are all saying. Um, JP Morgan actually has about 45,000 developers that we have in-house. Um, that are creating uh, applications for either internal applications or external applications. And we have multiple different lines of businesses which all have different tool chains and also have different lines uh, of different levels of control policies that they need to uh, adhere to. So it's like how do we create a single developer portal that will scale to that many people but also be able to uh, satisfy the needs of multiple lines of businesses. Um, and, but I think what Balaji was asking is it, the why is really around how do we decrease cognitive load, decrease context switching, and maybe even get rid of some of our existing applications and replace it with a single developer portal. Uh, yeah, great. That's great. I mean, this is just to want to hear all your thoughts around how, why you approached it in this way. And I think when you come to, to say, I'm going to do work on an IDP portal or use an IDP portal, how did you decide on your path? 
Right, I know Serena, you don't use backstage, and, and some of the others on the on the stage backstage. But I want to hear, like, how did you go about build in your case, like completely from scratch, versus like leveraging an open source project like CNCF? I want to see. I'm sure there's some of you are wondering the same thing. Yeah. Hey, you know, why should I use backstage? I can build on my own. I have engineers who can build it. Like, maybe just give you a thought process on why you made the choice, and if you have to make the choice now, what would you do? Yeah, this is great, great question. So uh, just so you all know too, I, I have only been at JP Morgan for about 16 months. When I joined there, they had already done, they had already looked into Backstage. At that point, there was no, um, if I'm not mistaken, there was no um, productized version of Backstage that had been proven out at like a, a scale of 40,000 developers at that point. So we already had a developer platform that was already, um, you know, we had our, a lot of our products already being utilized. We do use some of the CNCF stuff. We have some of our own homegrown. Uh, but the, the, at that point, uh, the decision was made to, to build because there was nothing that was proven out already at that scale. Um, the, so I, I was previously the one of the product managers for Developer Hub, so I was also involved in the backstage uh, community as well. So I, you know, for me, from a personal standpoint, I'm very vested into it. I, I love watching the, the progression of what's going on and how people are consuming it. So I think it's definitely something to look into for sure. Um, JP Morgan have, if they were going to do it, you know, if they're going to start today, I don't, you know, I, I don't know what would have happened at that point. All right, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Jay, I think you're an early adopter of Backstage from day one. Maybe you can, uh, you know, you, how did you choose uh, Backstage or how, how have you ever seen that? Yeah, so I think that when, uh, when American started Backstage, uh, American was one of the first to really implement Backstage. They, uh, the beta, when Spotify announced Backstage the beta was when American Airlines adopted it. So before then, it was really, oh, you want a developer portal? Oh, that's fantastic. Go run Create React app and figure it out. Uh, so the, I think the reason that Backstage was adopted was just it was the you know it was a need that it was a need that came up. We had the need. Spotify announced it. It's like, oh, this thing does that. Let's go try it. Um, you know, to kind of do that next leap instead of going to do completely homegrown because. For as complicated as Backstage is, obviously, and you have to have teams that run it, and uh, it does provide a lot of opinionated places to put code and uh, get that basic nugget of something maybe useful out there versus trying to go from a completely empty project. Yeah, I think um, Srini, I'm interested in your car because you you joined later. You're you're like a year and a half into the project, uh, so you probably looked at other options because it's a little more mature. Good. Yeah, first of all, Jay, I want to thank you for being the beta customer of Backstage <laughs> and making it better. Um, we were there when the scaffolder was in Go. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I mean, if you uh, if you're following Adobe, right? I mean, it's a 40 plus year old company, right? We all we have. Is, started with the desktop software, the boxes. That's what our first 20 years was. Then this cloud came and subscriptions model and all that. That's how we transitioned it, right? So um, I, I think our journey, when we started all of this, uh, it started before Kubernetes with the DCOS. And when Kubernetes started maturing, we started, we switched on to Kubernetes, right? That's our first journey, if you think about it, from 2019 and 20. Uh, we were carefully looking at what's out there. Uh, there is nothing big for CI, CD, or something like that. So we were not brave enough to pick anything else. So, so then 2021, when we started looking at the thing, so Argo started uh, getting into that phase of it. So then the next couple of years, we spent time taking Argo on top of Kubernetes and building a story around that. And I still remember in the 2020 Argo con, people asked uh, me and few others, what are you guys doing for portal and all that, right? Uh, we have our own internal portals, uh, but we were not brave enough to get started on the backstage. Uh, I think only uh, at the end of 2022, uh, I want to give a lot of uh, uh, kudos to our new leadership who joined, who actually saw the value of it. Many of us who come from the application background, these things and all that, right? ID is good enough, CLI is good enough. What do you mean? Why do you need portal, right? I think that's that's the kind of a, a, a mentality was there because those were the problems at that point of time. Uh, our code name for our tool is actually Ethos. Uh, we, we have a tool called Ethos Home, which was serving it. But uh, uh, at the end of 2022, it was very clear that we have to look at developer experience, not just only cloud, 
but the entire uh, thing, half of the people are not cloud, right? So at that point of time, uh, we evaluated backstage for the second time. And we said, okay, instead of starting from the scratch, this is the right way to go. And two years into it, I did ask my, this question to a few of my uh, team members. Uh, uh, if there was a no backstage in the last two years, would you have achieved what you have achieved right now? The answer is no. Uh, backstage has provided quite a bit of a foundation for us. Uh, nothing is perfect, uh, but I think it gave us enough foundation for us to get to where we are today, and uh, we are in a massive scale of doing backstage. And thank you for the platform and Peter Tusney. <laughs> <laughs> I think you had an interesting observation that for a smaller organization, it's a great way to get started. Maybe you can just share your quick opinion. Sure. So I wanted to draw on my meta experience, which is uh, about three years old now. But for an organization meta size with uh, 40,000 plus engineers and over 3,000 people in the development infrastructure organization, they would invest in building the tools internally that uh, power their mainstream use cases. Of course, there are use cases for backstage that are not the mainstream. Um, and to draw um, on something that Srinivas just said uh, for my more recent experience at Roku, so the engineering uh, is divided into embedded side and cloud side, roughly. There are also web developers and mobile developers, but those are the two bigger buckets. And they have they operate very, very differently. It's almost like two different cultures. Mm -hmm. uh, and so each group had their own um, developer portal that was pseudo-functional. And we started, um, we haven't fully embraced Backstage yet. It's uh, six months into adoption. Um, but um, it, it does provide, I, I think it's, it's critical to pick one group, right? That's gonna be your early adopters, which is the cloud group for us. Um, and then the rest will follow uh, using Adobe's example, hopefully. Yeah, that's a great segue. Like, um, you know, I mean, if you've already answered it, that's fine. How did you choose sort of the initial group or initial tactic of insertion? Particularly if it's a, a large organization with a lot of uh, competing people have different opinions. <laughs> how did you say, hey, uh, how do, what is your strategy towards insertion and expansion strategy? Maybe uh, uh, you can start, yeah, Srini. Yeah, let's start with the group, right? Which group should be owning and uh, starting this, <laughs> owning this one? I'm sure in your organization, there are at least two or three groups who are already doing something like this, right? And they feel um, one of them is better than others, right? If that is not happening in your organization, I'm surprised. So usually you start with uh, one of those gro two groups and bring those groups together under one VP. That's a good progress, right? So uh, I think, uh, uh, the initial, uh, the way to get started, uh, which we did, uh, is the right way to do, is um, have a strategy of integrate first. We probably will not be able to add a lot of value right away, right? But able to, within the smaller organization, within the smaller group, if you can retire two or three existing portals and bring it all together into one place, that's a good start to start with. It will definitely not the destination, right? But it's a good start because that will help establish your brand. You are here to be able to add value here. And then you start uh, a, a combining into it. And usually you do it within your own organization. If you are not a customer zero, right? If you are not using yourself and your sister team is not using, then something is seriously wrong. There is no way you'll be able to tell entire company to do that, right? So that's a kind of an approach we kind of chose when we first started it. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of more other ways to start, but we are glad the way we did and it worked out. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. <clears throat> I think to, to give some, some color on that, while you're, you're v, you need your VP and your you know, director buy-in to give you funding, give you the political cover to go off and try this, uh, in terms of adoption, what is so very vital is that you gain mind share within your developers' uh, heads. And the way that you do that is obviously you can you can migrate an existing you know, portal, maybe you already have something to go get a VM or suggest you know, get network stuff, whatever, but uh, an even quicker win that you can do is go at the kind of dev level, you know, your senior devs, your, your, your managers, go network with the other teams and find a vital workflow at your company 
that is maybe a little clunky right now. Maybe no one likes doing it, right? It's because the, the team itself doesn't want to handle it. And pull that into your backstage, right? Uh, it has to happen. There's no options there. Teams have to do it. So you funnel your users through a quick win within your backstage. That gets them familiar with what it is, how it works, and hopefully if you do your job right, the DX that you expose is actually something that they think, oh, wow, that was, that was nice. What if, what if other things were also this nice, right? Um, so really finding a partner that, obviously it can be a portal, right? But writing, rewriting a portal inside of backstage is uh, not, uh, not a non-trivial amount of work. So if you can find a trivial process that is still vital, that can be your in, right? Because then you just announce to the company, hey, this thing that you hate doing is now nicer here. Go do it here. And then everyone has to go there, right? So keeping that mind share present and then other teams like it and then you start getting more adoption. But you have to force it at first. People are not going to do it willingly. All right. Any, anything you want to add, Senator, so now or? Yeah, I think one thing that we did was we did like a top task analysis. So we did it for a couple of different personas, SREs, as well as um, application developers. And what we, when we did a top task analysis, we ended up asking people like what were their most frequent tasks that they did as well as infrequent tasks that were really time consuming. Um, so that kind of, we did a few others as well, but that kind of helped us try to prioritize what we should do from a self-service perspective, for example, as well as some just day-to-day -day tasks. And then, you know, as you're, as you're talking to, like, you got the approach of having to go bottom up as well as top down. We also did a lot of conversations with our different lines of business, trying to uh, get buy-in from what was um, needed from them. So, and then also talked about extensibility capabilities, obviously. So maybe in the beginning, we're not having uh, extensions from outside of our organization, but once we get into GA, we'll, we will open those doors. Yeah, that's a great segue, I mean, you're just tuning up my next question, beautiful. <laughs> so, <laughs> How do you, uh, maybe I think you, you, you talked a little bit on who is going to maintain the backstage? Do you have separate teams? And who's going to write the plugins? Who's, you know, who's going to maintain them? Same with templates. <laughs> like, how do you, I mean, I know you, you, you're just starting the journey, so I think, or uh, whatever you are, right? So maybe just give you a little bit on that. And maybe around the, I think it's an important topic, right? Because people need to understand that level of investment needed, um, either your own, build your own, as well as uh, something adopting like backstage. So it'll be good to understand what the level of investment, how do you guys think about strategy, scalable strategy? Go ahead. So Balaji, I wish I was at this in the audience like seven, eight months ago and learned this wisdom from the panelists because I would have avoided some of the mistakes that we did, which was, you know, without funding, really, let's try this out because it's, it's a great tool. Folks who joined recently from other companies knew that it, it is great to have Backstage as the developer portal. And without really proper funding, we said, okay, you know, we're gonna, um, we're gonna implement it and we will announce it to our engineering community that, hey, this amazing tool is available, you know, come and um, onboard your tools, uh, use the templates, write your own. Uh, well, guess what, Jay is right. You have to, you know, you have to force it at first. <laughs> But before you force it, you have to have the team <laughs> that will be there to support it. So having it be somebody's or a team's kind of nights and weekends uh, responsibility or a hobby project does not scale. Make sure that you get proper funding, buy-in from the executives and funding in a team whose main job it is to, um, to implement, maintain, extend backstage. And yeah, who builds the templates? It can go either way, right? It's the, for us, I, I think, I think it should be the community who maintains backstage. I think it should be done by a centralized team. All right, Adobe, how are you, how are you approaching it? Yeah, where do I start? I mean, it's very, very important um, to make sure you have a good um, uh, buy-in from the executive leadership and you have a team dedicated for it one. And most of the time, most likely your portal, whatever you're developing is used by um, your other geos as well. This is not just one geo, right? You, like when you are sleeping, you have a team on the other side of the country. <laughs> they should be maintaining as well. So we were fortunate enough, I think, uh, we, we put a team, one team in US and one team in India who works jointly. And they are responsible for maintaining the backstage, the versions, the whole upgrades, the contributability part of it, 
and also, most importantly, doing the road shows and then thinking along how do you kind of uh, uh, make contributions happen and all that, right? That is a very, very important uh, part of it. I would like to thank, I asked William to sit here so that I can stare at him. He is my uh, US counterpart and Amit from India, your counterpart. I think they did an amazing job for us to get to this spot. This is, please don't think this is a trivial thing. So installing backstage and getting it operating is not a trivial thing. It's an ongoing thing and we need to invest really right on that. Yeah, I think this is uh, an incredible question because I think this strikes at the core of why backstage adoption at companies, at least from the companies that I've talked to, have failed, right? And I think ultimately it's kind of a misunderstanding about what backstage is from the get-go. Um, backstage is not a product. Backstage is something you use to build a product. And if you want to build a product, you have to have a product team. There is no other way to say that. And a lot of people think, oh, I can just install Backstage and I'll get it running and it'll suddenly magically be useful. Uh, there's all these incredible plugins. And the reality is, if, if that's the experience that you want, then go pay Port, go pay Humanitech, you know, to do it for you because that's what they do. You have to have a dedicated team and that's why that upward leadership buy-in is so important because you're not, you're not using a thing, you're building a thing. And that needs to be your mindset from the very get-go from the top to the bottom, because if that's not understood, you'll never go anywhere. Yeah, uh, certainly want to Yeah, the same here. We have, we have a dedicated team, and I think I think making sure that you do have a team that has SLAs, like SLAs and SRE team that's gonna be able to support it as well is really important. We also have something across the globe, so uh, California to, to uh, India as well. Um, the other thing you mentioned was extensions, and I think the interesting part about that for me, because I do have the UX twist here, is mm -hmm. when when people are pr providing their own extensions, it's really interesting to see if the larger team wants to make sure there's consistency across the experience. So as you're continuing to see additional um, uh, backstage plugins come in, you are seeing them interact more too, right? So like making sure that that experience is consistent is really important because we're still talking about deep decreasing cognitive load and making sure that you do that throughout those plugins is important in my opinion. I resonate very, very well with you. Yeah. I think. <laughs> Quality may vary. Yeah. I think, I think Jay, you talked about like, I think you guys don't use any community plug, you just use your own plugin so you have consistent experience. Um, uh, Adobe, from your perspective, like, well, I mean, or either of you, um, how do you recommend for others, right? I think, do, obviously there's a lot of commitment um, resources commitment to, to build and maintain all this. So. Yeah, so I probably have a bit of a stronger opinion in, in here than, than most in the community. So AA is one of the very earliest adopters. A lot of our stuff is home rolled um, and has been for many years. Generally, our approach has been the community plugins don't offer, and that's not to say we don't use any. We, we use many of the, the backstage ones, but not a whole lot of third party ones. The value of Backstage for us does not come from the fact that we can grab a plugin and have it do something, right? American is too old and too legacy for that off-the-shelf thing to even attempt to enco encompass the vast amounts of legacy. The value of Backstage for us is the fact that we have a requirement. It may not make sense at all, but it's been down that way for 40 years. So we're gonna go write some code React code, JavaScript code, to go make that happen. You're not gonna get that out of anything else, right? So I think fundamentally, if you're looking at Backstage and you're thinking, I'm gonna go spin this up, I'm gonna go install a bunch of plugins and it's gonna go do everything I want, Backstage is probably not the tool for you because it's too, you're not using its extensibility, you're not actually leveraging the power that it gives you, which is at its most core essence, I have logic that I'm gonna write code for. If you don't have logic that you think you need to write code for, you should probably go pay for something. Yeah, I think um, I also struggle a little bit uh, when you can take a backstage and you are not using a lot of backstage plugin. What's the point, right? So I struggle to answer that question to myself and a few of my leaders who asked that. But I think I do, uh, I do uh, uh, came to the conclusion for that answer, right? So there is a reason why it's an IDP. It's an internal developer portal, right? So if there are lots and lots and pockets of the tools and the groups within your organization. If you are able to bring the rest of your organization together using this plugin uh, uh, model, 
and them able to contribute to meet where they are, it's a huge success already, right? I think you don't have to chase for uh, uh, external plugins. If it, they come, it's a bonus at this point of time, but I don't think getting an enterprise lady plugin is not easy. I, so far, none of the thing, other than the announcement plugin, <laughs> yeah. I don't think any of the plugin that we can drop in anywhere. But that's yeah. that's that's okay because I think, uh, uh, like, uh, uh, the big thing that we were we are achieved is we we invested a quite a bit in the contribution model, and lot of uh, I mean there is no way you can put the entire developer experience entire into under one VP. That is not happening, right? No matter how many reorgs you do, right? They are all over. So. I think you need to meet them, and this is a great way uh, if you can uh, educate how to write the plugin because documentation is already there, and then get that part of it. And I want to really build the UX part because plugins is not the story. Plugins is how you get rest of the your company into it. But the way to tell, give your uh, audience is you don't sell plugins. You actually tell them workflows, right? That's where the UX comes in and all that. So you need to wear a different hat when you are talking to the partner integrations, yeah, get the plugins. But when you are talking to your uh, uh, use cases and all that, don't sell plugins. Just talk to them about their pains, their use cases. Yeah, yeah. I think the the plugins is still early stage, and like a out of the box plugin. I know there are like 200 plugins um, out there. Um, I think to your point, the consistency is, may not be there because everybody is different company writing plugins. So you know, when you put it into one single product, it doesn't look the same because one is different, another is different, and that's that's a challenge. You know, you can't write obviously every tool also yourself. Um, and I think as a as a vendor of uh, plugins or a creator of integrations, like if you have a product backend product that you want to create a plugin, make sure that, I guess, maybe you should create a, like a SIG or something to create a, like an um, experience uh, model. That's a good one. Anyway, let, let me think about that. Um, cool. So I know we have a couple of minutes. Um, maybe we can talk about what's your plan for the next six or 12 months, you know, you know, wherever you are in your journey. Uh, that would be good. Maybe, Serena, from your Yeah, I think the two key, th well, three key things we're going to be doing is continuing a self-service going more hybrid cloud. Um, the next thing I think is um, pulling in AI. So uh, we're looking at it in different different areas, whether that's in context help, uh, proposed learning, how to fix a pipeline error, those type of things. Um, and then the third one is around observability. Okay, Jay. Yeah, so I think uh, from us, for from the backstage point of view, uh, there's a few different things going on. Um, we're really trying to hone in on UX right now kind of working with the UI UX team to solidify those workflows. Uh, there's, we're doing a lot of work on really solidifying the template, the templates that we have to espouse best practices ac across the organization, not just kind of at the code level, but also in what other infrastructure you spin up. And then finally, and this one's a little dearer to my heart because I'm now more on the back end side of things, is really uh, expanding the the catalogs deep integrations into our shared runtime platform right because for American backstage is not just a place you go fill out a form and uh, get access to something or, or, or go look at something else it's it's truly the the front end, the front door for runtime right so really and app teams will go to our backstage instance to manage their runtime deployment so deepening those integrations and, and really accepting that there's multiple personas that use your backstage. You have people just coming for access. And then for us, you have people that are coming to manage their application. They're coming here to do, do a DR failover. They're coming to uh, go check if you know their, their pods are alive, stuff like that. So trying to optimize maybe the, for the more power user is some of the stuff that we're looking at really hard. Okay, Srini. Yeah, that's cool. You both mentioned observability and runtime. So I would like to learn from you guys next year. <laughs> um, yeah, I think from our perspective, um, like I said, right, I think so far we achieved two things. We were able to uh, have a centralized portal. We integrated lots of stuff. Uh, and second thing, this year actually we did a quite a bit because from the Adobe perspective, it's experience, right? The experience that we put up was not good enough. So actually it was challenged. So we actually put a new experience on top of it. If you look at our portal, you will not even you can't even imagine it's a backstage, right? It's like it looks like an Adobe product. So we achieved those two. So I think where we want to get to head is unification right now. So so that it's all about workflows and bringing it all together and bring it all together in such a way. And I'm inspired by the 
uh, AWS demo as well on how you can actually go there, see there, and ask the diagnostics part of it right there. So I heard you are open sourcing it, so I'm coming after you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah it definitely is interesting. Go ahead. Uh, I know we are the only thing between folks in the audience and lunch, <laughs> so keeping it short. No? Okay. Um, so uh, for us, I think it's the main thing is communication and alignment, organizational alignment, that this is the thing to do and that um, we should uh, we should commit to one developer portal and get securing funding. And then we will be driving the self-serve model. Awesome. I'm sure there are a lot of questions. Um, feel free to, I can bring the mic or this mic is a live, live I think. I can give my mic as well. Anybody has questions? You guys are so clear. Okay, there you go. You all talked about the importance of having a product team for Backstage. Can you elaborate on the size of those teams or maybe the makeup of who's involved in maintaining the Backstage product? Yeah, so I can, I can speak for us and for us, we have two, you can think of them as, as orgs, and then I'll jump into the, the specifics there. For the website side of things, I'd, I think they reorged somewhat recently, so it might be a little out of date, but I'd probably put it at four to five people, full-time, React, working on the website, right? And then there's a variety of backend services that Backstage uh, Core uses for uh, certain integrations, so there's another three to four people dedicated to those uh, services as well. So that's going to be probably nine to ten for the website and associated services. And then that org also encompasses the shared pipelines that the templates generate and the templates themselves. So it's, I think it's at around another nine or ten people for the pipelines and the templates. That's for the entire enterprise. And then for the shared runtime platform, which is a separate org that we run a shared Kubernetes uh, cluster, we have about four to five hundred applications in a single cluster. Uh, that is a standard kind of ops team, and that's you're looking at about 15 to 20 people uh, to manage that at scale. So, all in all, I'd probably put it around 40 to 50 people managing the whole platform thing from A to Z. Um, Srini, you have a quick, quick answer. I think you, you're probably the sort of a different size from an investor perspective. Yeah, I cannot comment on the exact size, but I think the way, yeah, like I said, right, uh, P, IDP, P is not a portal, it's a platform, right? So there's a lot of stuff that you need to do behind the scenes for your shiny things to come up. So that is a big organization for us, and then lots of people are doing lots of stuff to be able to get to that part of it. Just for the portal, I think that, like I said, I think we have divided into small teams, both in US and uh, India for each. And then, of course, there is a, I'm not counting any of the evangelism and everything else that comes on top of it. Right? The one thing that I want to leave you guys is, I mean, SRE and DevOps, I mean, many of us have come with different, different backgrounds, right? We have to definitely put together a team who understands React, Node.js, and, uh, uh, Node and application development. And that is a kind of a team that is needed. You have to bring in either upscale or bring that team so that they are the one who are going to help do this magic, right? This is not a YML. I mean, this is, there's a lot more things that are needed out here. Got it. Any other questions? Yeah, question. Yeah, I had a question uh, more specifically for, for Jay. Um, uh, with American adopting so early and developing so many um, custom plugins, uh, what has that been like as Backstage has developed and progressed and the plugin structure has changed, like keeping all of those up to date, how do you, how do you keep up with that? I mean, I guess you have a large team, but. Uh, painful. <laughs> um, the, uh, to sum it up in one word, painful, yes. Um, at a kind of a maybe a more specific answer there is that we try to keep on the, on the edge as much as we can. The migration's a new backend system. We completed that. It was a month-long project to bring the standalone plugins along. We have a significant amount of, of custom stuff, and it's getting it is getting a little better. But the the answer is really just that it's a large, very large node project. All of your standard pains that come with that are expected. So we really just kind of hit it head on. Um, 
I think the last migration or two migrations ago, it did end up causing an outage, so we're not perfect, but there's a reason that we have so many people working on it. It is a complex beast, and I, I never like to sugarcoat that to people. It is a significant investment. Any, any other questions? If you have a question, uh, you want to come down here? Let me give it to you. It's okay. Hello. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, different strategies for scaffolder templates like um, a central team, a central team versus bring your own templates that other teams uh, use? Because the first one, uh, it's not, it's pretty tricky for mid-sized companies uh, who doesn't have, you know, thousands of employees. Uh, are you asking what are what are uh, strategies on templates with? Yeah. yeah. So that's a very, um, it's a very nuanced question there. I think there's there's two two parts of it. One is that a lot of people have a tendency to overload the scaffolder. The scaffolder is tremendously powerful, but in many ways from what we've seen is that everyone kind of sees backstage templates as the end all. If you are shoving too much logic into your backstage templates, you should write a plugin, right? So don't overload your templates. They are fundamentally a template. They create something, be that, you know, most likely some kind of repository and some other minor integrations. Don't shove whole workflows that do complex logic into your, your scaffold or you're in for a world of hurt. And then the, the secondary uh, part of that is that you have, you know, once you figure out if you have a, a valid template use case, then it's in, important to decide, well, who owns it? So what we've done at American is that we have a set of templates that we have, uh, that we call certified. Right, and they come with a little badge inside of uh, backstage, inside of our backstage instance, and they show up at the top. And we promise that these are up to date with all the latest security stuff, uh, dependency upgrades, all the latest features on our runtime platform, that sort of thing. And then, if anyone wants to bring their own template, we have the documentation to do that, but it's differentiated within a different section. Right, so it's really that certified. We promise this is going to work um, versus the community. Hey, use it at your own risk, and that's worked out well for us. It hasn't really been uh, there hasn't really been any uh, confusion on that. People know, hey, yellow certified, this one's going to work. Template, maybe a little risky. Yeah, I think I would say if you have reached the problem of like a templates, that means you have a backstage adoption. That's the great news. Once you have a backstage adoption, right? So I think. Uh, able to have a templates in such a way that you have a golden templates and then you have paved roads around with that. So that is a kind of a realization that we are coming on to. But once, you, once everybody is there, you want to give less controls, opinionated, and you are able to kind of see what it can do. Simple is better, less is more. So these are the kinds of an approaches that you want to kind of take. Yeah, Aggressively well, favor plugins over templates, generally. Yeah. So one thing, I guess, uh, I, I'm going to work on the community. We have a lot of sample templates. Maybe we can contribute some of the templates. Obviously, it's, you can't just use it as it is in your organization. But at least you have a starting point, right? You don't have to, you know, for large organizations, they have a lot of things. But for smaller organizations, how do you get started, right? And so there's a, a, a library that is already there with 70, 80 uh, templates. But we can add more. So I will take that as an action to to make it more available, widely available, and communicate to the community. Any any other questions? All right. Thank hey, you so much. Oh, there's one more. You have a question it? right here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I had a question. You guys talked about developer experience. Is it improving the developer experience for your organization? Is it also making you guys more efficient? Is it able to uh, make your organization hire more code-focused um, developers? Or does it uh, bring down um, the time to first commit? Like, Is it making your organization more um, efficient when it comes to developing and hiring new developers? Or a new developer is able to come in and immediately get on the project and things of that nature? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. Um, and obviously, we're all here for, for that answer, right? Like, you don't just build a portal 
to build a portal and go write React code for fun. Um, you're actually trying to get some kind of benefit out of it. So I think the best answer to that question is to kind of do a, for American, is to do a comparison and contrast. Um, before, before backstage and you know, before some of our, our cloud stuff, you want a new system, that's going to take you months. It's going to take you months to go get a VM. It's going to take you months to go figure out who to set up the correct networking stuff within our data centers, go through three layers of onshore, nearshore, offshore um, to, to figure it out. And now the days to, to compare, I have, uh, whenever I go evangelize this to other architects, I go talk to other teams, because we are, you know, we're still trying to very bulk, like I said earlier, balkanized companies, like you should come to us. I like to say that you can go from zero to production in 20 minutes with our system, and that's true. You can go from not a single, you don't even have a repository, to a productionized American Airlines application with a .aa.com URL in 20 minutes, under 20 minutes. I've done it in seven. Um, so yes, it has gone from months to seven minutes. A more practical example of that actually moving a dial somewhere is, and I think I can talk about this, it was on the earnings call. Um, as you might know, American is very heavily unionized, right? And every time the pilots or the flight attendants, they get a new contract every, every few years. And there's always a lot of expectations on IT because every time you get a new contract, you come with a whole lot of new expectations for, well, everything that they do to interact with stuff. And historically, American Airlines IT has taken forever to deliver those obligations, uh, suffering hundreds of millions of dollars in fines to the union because IT was unable to meet those obligations, right? Uh, the contract's five years, and in many ways, people would say in AA, well, we'll finish the, we'll finish the contract by the, the time the next one gets renewed, right? So four to five years to do this stuff was, was standard. Using the new pilot contract just got ratified uh, beginning of this year, I think. The pilot team immediately, and it required a whole set of new systems. The pilot team jumped into action using Backstage with us and our, our runtime platform. They delivered the entire system in seven months, years ahead of schedule from before, um, saving hundreds of millions of dollars in fines. So in terms of an actual use case, that's about as real as you're going to get there. Well, on that note, thank you so much for the panel. Thank you, Lilith. Thank you, Srini. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Serena, for sharing your uh, knowledge and wisdom. Uh, thanks for the audience for sticking it on after the, for the, before the lunch. And uh, we'll see you back at 1.30. Thank you.